<laughs> um, I want to thank our contractor. You guys don't know, like, some of our contractors actually go to church here, people who work on our building. Man, the floors look incredible. I want to thank them for the hard work on the floors. Uh, we went with concrete so nobody can argue over the color of the carpet. Isn't that great? If you grew up in church, you know what I'm talking about. It's a funny joke. But anyways. Uh, but we are excited. Progress is happening every single week. We're hoping the next couple of weeks, like I said, we can get the CO for this north side, open it up, and uh, start seeing the building take on more transformation. Worlds of Wow will be here in a couple of weeks to finish out the kids section. Uh, a lot of exciting things. Revival coming up. Ten-year revival. Uh, super, super excited about that. And uh, a lot of stuff going on. We just finished a series um, about prayer. And so if you miss any of that, you can go back online to watch that. But uh, our word for 2022 as a church, we said, was stretch. And we're trying to stretch toward wholeness and healing, which, is, which means basically this. It's just a fancy word for saying personal transformation. I think that if you've been in church long enough, uh, sometimes you can be in church so long that you just kind of like go through the motions and you forget that being a follower of Jesus is not about all the external um, changes that we can make. In fact, it's, I find it kind of concerning and, and also disheartening as a pastor that even when you run into people who maybe haven't been in church in years or they, they don't go to church it's, it's immediately the external things that they are concerned about that I'm concerned with, right? Like if they come to church, it's am I wearing the right clothes? Um, if I have a tattoo, I got to explain myself. If I, like there's, there's all these thoughts and generalizations about church that I just, I find it really, really, um, was that a bug? Listen, <laughs> your boy gets traumatic when it comes to bugs and spiders and stuff. Y'all are lucky. I didn't know. Is this still there? No. Uh, I'm going to be doing that the entire experience now. I was teaching Tuesday to our staff, and a stink bug landed like right next to my, I thought it was a spider, y'all. I lost my mind. And I was teaching on emotional trauma. I was like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Where was I? So uh, this journey, though, <laughs> towards... Personal transformation, uh, I believe as a church, like we're doing a series after this called The Way, and we're going to spend a lot of time there, um, and, and it's just basically talking about what it means to really live this life in Jesus and be a disciple of Christ and be a follower of Jesus. I'm super, super excited about the journey we're going to go on as a church, but even this series, as we're pushing toward this personal transformation, how many of you know relationships have a lot to do with our emotional well-being, our relational well-being, our spiritual well-being. I said this in my prayer. We are created for a relationship. It's something that we cannot live. Don't miss this. You cannot live without relationship. You can't. But it, how many of you know it's also at the center of most of our dysfunctions? And so when we talk about red flags, uh, and I want to mention this. I actually started a podcast back in January uh, and this, this whole podcast is just an opportunity for me to talk deeper on some of the conversations we have on Sunday. I can't cover all the, the depths of what we talk about. If, you, if you're interested in that, it's called the Made to Win podcast. But it really is this idea of like, if we're going to win in our spiritual life, we have to win from within first. We have to find wholeness and healing in our hearts and our spirits. And so uh, I, I, if you want to check that out, you can. But in this series, we talk about red flags. How many of you know that this, this idea comes from when you go to the beach? If you've ever been to the beach and you see a red flag, it tells you that, hey, that these currents are super strong and that basically you need to swim at your own risk. But how many of you know there's also another sign that says double red flag? And that double red flag means the beaches are closed, water's closed, you're not supposed to get in. Here's the crazy thing. Most drownings happen because people ignore the flags. Now, I know you would never do that, but I'm just saying, like, if you've ever been on vacation, and you know, like, we only got a few days here, and the flags have been red all week, what's your, you're probably going to say, well, let's, let's get in the water. We came to the beach, we're getting in the water. The problem is, that's how most of us treat relationships. 
You know, you've seen the warning signs. You know it's dangerous, but you're like, huh, I came here to swim. I came here to find somebody, right? Like, we're going we're gonna to do this. And so some of this is understanding, like, some of your relationships. Can I tell you, I'm going to go ahead and say this up front so we don't forget this. All of us have red flags. All of us. So I want you to understand what I'm not saying throughout this series. I'm not saying that if you have some of these red flags, you're hopeless. Or that the person you're with is hopeless. What I am saying is like some of you need to swim at your own risk. What I also want to remind you is if you're in a relationship that you're not married and you are seeing these red flags, some of you need to know the, the difference between, hey, I'm swimming at my own risk and some of you need to get out of the water. Like you need to get out now. I want to remind you, if you are married, do not go home and say, Pastor said you were a red flag. You had like nine of those, and so we're done. Because I know how some of y'all are. Y'all use my sermons against one another. My staff does this to me all the time. Like, I'm like, did y'all listen, or y'all just trying to pick up lines to abuse each other every day, right? Some of y'all do that, though. You go home, and I, 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 your husbands hate me because y'all use what I say against. Anyways, you got to figure it out. Here's, here's what I would say. So if you're married and you're walking through some of these red flags, here's what I want to remind you. Maybe you need, like, the counseling Coast Guard, right? How many of you know when you are in dangerous waters, what do they tell you? You cannot swim against the current, but how do they tell you to get out of the ocean to go with the current? Can I tell you, some of you, it may be a journey for you to get to calm waters or get to the beach. But you got to start swimming in the right direction. Okay? So just know through this series, you may have to figure out which direction are we swimming. Because if you're trying to swim against the current, it's not going to end well. Okay? But for some of you, it is. It's recognizing like, hey, these are some issues. So let's talk about what a red flag is in relationships. A red flag is a sign that a person will turn out to be or is a bad or problematic partner. Like you're seeing signs that this could be a recurring problem, right? And I get it. I mean, but they look so good. You know, she's hot. He's handsome. He's cute. Whatever. But cute don't keep the lights on, right? And, And so like there's problems that we see when we run into relationships, but we've got to figure out, like some of you it is, it's date at your own risk, some of you is get out now. And here's what I want to tell you. If you are in a dating relationship or even a marriage relationship that is physically abusive, that's, you need to get out. And you're saying, why would you say this in church? Because there are people who come to church every week who go home and live in fear. I've seen it time and time again. And if you need help, don't be afraid to stop at, a, at one of our uh, desks out here and talk to somebody and I say, hey, I need help. I promise you, we got some guys in this church that are barely saved. They'll help you out. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And you know who I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> so like, that's me, bro. I barely, I mean, I know Jesus, but, you know, I'll, I'll introduce other people to him. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. But some of us need to understand where these red flags are come from um because all of us are products of the relationships in our lives we're products of our parenting we're products of who we spend our time with uh the dating relationships our friendships we're we're all products in fact most of our emotional or psychological trauma has come at the hands of people and so if that's true the problem is is we never deal with that or wrestle with why I am the way I am birthed out of some of these trauma. We can go through our entire lives basically treating everybody else the way that we have been treated or the way that we have been affected. And some of us have to take responsibility in our lives and understand, yes, I may have grown up in this dysfunction, but I do not have to let it drive my decisions in my life. It's taking responsibility for what happened to you, but then making a decision to do something different. And so we have to wrestle with that today. We talk about all the time, hindsight's twenty twenty. Anybody ever heard that phrase? And it's this idea of I've learned from my dysfunctional past, but here's what I think is even better, is that foresight is better than hindsight. And what I want to give you is this, this revelation of saying, I can actually have the discernment and wisdom to see what's going to happen. 
because this red flag tells me, hey, yeah, you, you can go ahead and swim at your own risk, but just know you are in a high probability of abuse or dysfunction or neglect or abandonment or divorce because you see the signs up front. And that's what I want to give you today is foresight. So what if there were warning signs that prepared us for what was to come, but we chose to either ignore it or believe we were strong enough to endure? Because some of you, it's, it's not that um, you, you ignore their red flags because you think you can swim, but that's not the issue. The issue is all the people around you can't swim. And so some of you are drowning out. You're drowning your kids in the dysfunction of relationships. You're drowning family because now they're being impacted by some of your decisions and choices. And so we have to be able to see this foresight. So in this series, we're going to address some of those warning signs. Today's kind of an overview of some of the things we're going to talk about specifically over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I want you to not drown in the dysfunction of your relationships. I want you to recognize warning signs and learn how to deal with them in a proper way. So the red flag we are going to address today is the self is, is a lack of self-awareness. A lack of self-awareness. Because here's what we are really good at. We are really good at telling everybody else where their red flags are. But we are terrible at recognizing our own. Because here's what I want to remind you of. All of your relationships, guess who is the same common denominator in all of your relationships? I'll give you a hint. It's you. We have a saying that we like to say that wherever you go, there you are. And so some of us have even walked through our lives and, and thought, like, why are all these people bad? And why have they done? And at some point in your life, you have to come to recognize, what are the red flags in me? What are the things that I need to do to make sure that not only can I recognize red flags in others, but I can recognize it in myself? In other words, you have to look at the man or the woman in the mirror. So let's go back to our opening scripture. Proverbs 27, 12. I love this. A prudent person foresees danger. That means they are acting or showing care for the future. Something I've tried to teach my kids as they're growing older, I have a 15-year-old, soon to be 16-year-old, is that you think that high school is just, you just kind of float through high school, but some of you are in your 40s and you made decisions in high school that are still following you today. And so it really is understanding, like, if I, I have to start making, I, I, I had a conversation with my daughter last night, you have to start making some adult decisions, and we have to guide you in making those adult decisions. And so some of us have to be able to say, when I start making this decision, it's not only how does it feel in this moment, but how could it affect me two years from now? How could this affect my future? We forget to do that. And this is what he says, and take, takes precautions. That's what a wise or a discerning person does. But look, what, look at the reverse or the opposite. The simpleton, which simply means somebody who has no wisdom, no care to learn, unteachable, unlearnable. They're just living life by the seat of their pants and by every emotion, desire that comes their way. That's what a simpleton is. You can't, you ever, you know, it's that, that the, what would the prophet say? Can't nobody tell me nothing? That's the simpleton. And look what happens. They go blindly on and suffer the consequences. And that word blindly is so key because blindly is not a condition that they can't control. They just choose to walk blindly. It's pretty powerful, right? This is, called, this is also called wisdom. Most people's destructive decisions stem from you not envisioning the outcome. In fact, I want to go to one of my favorite scriptures in Proverbs 5. You need to go read the entire chapter, but I want to focus on just a couple of verses. In Proverbs 5, Solomon has given wisdom to his sons about not following after immoral women. And he says this. He says, listen, because if you do this, if, if you make this decision, here is where you will be in your life. Check, that, check this out in Proverbs 5, 12 through 14. He says, if you, go, if you follow through with this, if you follow through with your desires and not see the red flags, here's what you will say. How I hated wisdom. If only I had not ignored all the red flags. 
And check this out. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I have come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. And he's saying this with a foresight. He's saying, listen, you haven't said this yet in your life, but I'm telling you, if you don't pay attention to red flags, that's where you're going to be. How many of you have ever, don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever made decisions, you thought, man, if I'd only listened, if I'd only recognized and heeded the warnings, things would be different. And so the idea is foresight, not hindsight. It's understanding that we can see ahead. So here's the thing. If you never take time to envision the dangerous outcomes of your decisions, you cannot be mad that you suffer the destructive results of your decisions. And some of us will live a life of bitterness and frustration and dysfunction because we've never wrestled with our own decision-making process. And that's where we have to be. We have to recognize this in ourselves. I don't want to be a simpleton. I don't want to be somebody who just walks through life blindly. I want to be able to take foresight. So listen, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. A couple of verses that I think will help us out too as we take this journey to be self-aware. Uh, Jesus is talking about a subject that we misinterpret many times. But he says this in Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others. And here's really the key to this verse. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Here's what I want you to know about a perfect judge. They judge with two standards, justice and mercy. And here's what Jesus is addressing, is that I can trust God to judge perfectly. Can we agree with that if you're a believer in Jesus? I trust that he will judge in justice and in mercy. Here's what I can't trust is that we do that all the time. Because while we are calling for justice for other people's mistakes and sin, How many of you know we we desire mercy when it comes to our own? So you realize he's talking about something deeper here because we like to throw that out there. You can't judge me. Jesus says don't judge. But he also says later to judge by somebody's fruit that they bear. That's not the point of the conversation here. The point of the conversation is, is that Jesus reminds us that by the same heart that you are trying to tell somebody else how to live their life, you better believe it's coming right back to you first. And look what he goes on to say. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. He's saying, listen, I know the the end goal would be to help your friend, but let's be honest. He uses a humorous, funny analogy to make this big point. I mean, imagine somebody walking around with a log in their eye, right? That sounds pretty silly. But the point Jesus is making is that most of the time, what we spend our time and our energy and our focus at looking at other people's problems, really we're not seeing their problems. What we're seeing is our own. We just don't address it. Because here's what I know is true in our lives. God will send you mirrors to address your mess. Can I tell you that most of the people that you are frustrated with in your life are just like you? They're sent to actually, like, the thing that you are trying to, like, say to them. Like, you ever had, like, people try to tell you how to live your life, and you're like, bro, have you seen your wife? Have you seen your marriage, your relationship? You're trying to tell me how to live my life? You know, you know what God also does? This is how I know he has a sense of humor. He gives us children. <laughs> they are mirrors of us. They are the best and the worst of us, aren't they? The thing you are frustrated over, most of the time you go, dear Lord, that's me. That was me, right? And most of the time, God will bring those situations up to get you to say, I need to deal with this. I need to go deal with this law. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand that most of the time, the bigger issue is us learning how to focus on our own self-awareness and say, God, bring healing and wholeness to my life first. Bring transformation to me first. Stop demanding that everybody else change when I'm not willing to change myself. It takes these steps 
for us to say, I need to stretch toward personal transformation in my own life. Some of you are here because you're trying to get maybe your husband, your spouse, or somebody else in your life to change. And what I want you to know, this goes back to our series on prayer. You cannot change the will of a person, but you can have the Holy Spirit transform your own heart to a place where they might receive what you have anything to say. Because most of them will never listen to what you have to say until they see what the Holy Spirit has done in your own life. And then you won't have to tell them they'll desire it because they see it. Man, is that help, helping anybody today? So I, this is going to sound like a lot, but I promise you we got through it pretty fast in the first one. I'm going to talk about 13 red flags that you need to address. Now, again, this is yourself. Look inward first and say, what do I need to address? Because remember, red flags don't mean we're hopeless. Can I tell you, I was a walking red flag when my wife married me. Thank God she was a good swimmer. That's all I can say. Um, But I'm telling you, I'm standing up here as living proof that there's hope and that God can take any mess or situation and bring restoration and healing. Amen? So first red flag, they treat you sweet, but they treat everyone else differently. This is especially for you ladies, maybe you're single, and and you're like, everybody else is telling you this guy's a jerk. You just don't know Billy. You don't know him. He is the sweetest guy, but watch how he treats other people. How does he treat his mama? How does he treat siblings? How do they treat the waitress or the server in a restaurant? Can I tell you, however they treat everybody else is how they will eventually treat you. So that's a red flag. If they treat you better than everybody else, then something's not right there. Secondly, they're emotionally reckless on a regular basis. Does everything turn into an offense or a fight? Is, is, are they quick-tempered? Are they cold sho- Every time something's wrong, cold shoulder, right? The slamming of the cabinets. What's wrong? Nothing, right? Dishes are being slammed. Just know the devil's a liar. Something's wrong, <laughs> right? But instead of actually communicating like a mature emotional person, it turns into emotional outbursts that's just constant. You ever feel like you just can't win? Because there's something that's always, they take a, there's, there's a problem all the time, and that is because they are reckless emotionally, and there has to be something there to address whatever's deep-seated inside of their heart and their life. Don't look at them. I know this is hard right now. <laughs> they cut off all other relationships except you and expect you to do the same. I see this a lot. Listen, I was in student ministry for 15 years before I became a pastor. I see this a lot in teenage dating. And it usually happens in relationships where the girl doesn't have a good relationship with her father. And so she's easily manipulated and easily pulled away. Can I tell you, this is infatuation and it's manipulation at its worst. And so when infatuation is near, all other relationships disappear. You ever see that where it's like, man, they don't talk to their parents anymore. They don't, talk to their, they don't hang out with their friends anymore. That is dangerous. And can I tell you, 14, 15, 16, you are in no place in your maturity of your life to be spending that much time with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You ain't married and you ain't ready to be married. I got, I'm, I'm slowing down on the responses, so I must be hitting some nerves. But like... This, this happens in marriage, though, too. I've seen people marry somebody, and they pull them away from their family. If your spouse tells you that you are not allowed to see your family or talk to them, or their, or their goal is to constantly pull away and not be near family or any other authority, then you need to know that is a red flag. I've seen that happen because a lot of times they'll pull you out of church. I tell you, some of you will follow somebody wherever they go because you want that feeling of love and you'll follow them right out into the deep end and drown. So the next one, always blaming others for their mistakes. It's never their fault. It's mama's fault, daddy's fault, it's Obama's fault, like whoever, like you're just blaming everybody, right? And you never take responsibility for your own actions. Can I tell you, that is an immature emotional person. Someone who grows up understands that I am fully responsible for how I treat people, how I respond in times of tension and conflict, 
how I, how I treat my spouse. How, I, can I tell you, men, this, and this is something that we are guilty of, but when you come home, I get it. Whether you've been working, whether you've dealt with whatever, some of you have stressful jobs, but can I tell you, you're still fully responsible with how you bring that home to your family and how you treat them when you come home. You cannot use the excuse. I've seen, I've seen marriages divide because men never, never counted the cost of the type of work they got into. It happens a lot in first responders, firefighters, police. I get it because they carry a huge weight and stress in what they do. But what I want you to know, men, is if you're going to step into something like that, count the cost of what you have to go through mentally and emotionally to be responsibly and mature with how you bring that home to your family. I have to do that in past. Like I, there's, you see the horror stories sometimes, and even with pastors' kids or whatever, because they spend so much time wrapped up in the dysfunction of their own mess and, and pastoring a church that they never love their families the way they need to love them. I've made a covenant and commitment to my family that they are my first and foremost ministry. And they know like, it's me responsible for coming home and making sure I love them like Jesus more than anybody else. Because let me tell you something. It does not matter how many of you like my sermon. If they don't like daddy when I come home from preaching a sermon, then I am a hypocrite. I'll take all three of those. <laughs> Maturity says I take ownership and responsibility. Here's one. They idolize you. This is big. You know what idols are in our lives? Anything that we ask to save us. And some of you think a relationship's going to save you. See it all the time. You've walked through a divorce and you jump right into somebody, somebody else and you're already sleeping with them and you're, it's like you're living it up and really you've made them your idol. You're saying, you, you, some of y'all think Tom Cruise, was a th- like his, he actually quoted the Bible when he said, you complete me. You realize that's nowhere in the Bible. Some of y'all quote that like it's in the Bible. It's not in Second Hesitations 4-2 or anything like that. <laughs> Some of y'all are looking for that. That's, that's the Old Testament, isn't it? <laughs> but some of y'all, you're just like, you complete me. That wasn't Tom Cruise. That was Dr. Evil. <laughs> so, any Dr. Evil? Anybody? No? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sinners. All right. But can I tell you, we've talked about this before, a person cannot rescue you. In fact, some of y'all are like, I, just, I need somebody to save me. Somebody already did come to save you. And he lived over 2,000 years ago. You don't need somebody else to save you. No one completes you. We think that marriage or relationships are two halves equal a whole, and that's not right. Two whole people make a whole couple. And the problem that we have is a lot of people out there are thinking that when I find that person who will fulfill me, no one's meant to fulfill you. The Bible says that when, when Eve was created, she was created to be a helpmate, not to complete him, but to add to him. Yes. Relationships should add value, not take away, and not come with the mentality of they complete me. You know what idols really are? They're things that we elevate on a pedestal, but they have no power. Again, I see this a lot in student ministry. It's like your favorite worship song is, you're a good, good boyfriend. It's who you are. It's funny, you see, I mean, it's like, you're just worse, but you're not really worse, but you're just trying to get noticed, you know? You're like, Jesus, Jesus, you know? It's like, you really don't want to worship, you want to be worshiped. And if they, I, if they put you, if they're willing to sacrifice their faith, their family, whatever, for your... They have made you an idol. I'm going to tell you something. Whatever gets elevated, you're going to find out real quick that if it's not Jesus, they will let you down. Because none of us are perfect. Last time I checked, ain't nobody in this room walked on water. If you have, please see us afterward. We want to talk about that. (laughs) Leave your drugs at the door. But anyways, like, (laughs) another red flag, you tend to fall in love easily. And we'll talk about this in the last, I'm excited about the last sermon in the series. We'll talk about the difference between desire and love because a lot of, our, our culture is real big on desire but not love. And there is a difference. But some of you, it's like, you know, you've told me like, this, he's the one. Three months later. No, I promise, they're the one. No, I promise you, this is the one. I know I, know I said that about Jim and Billy, but Bobby, he's the one. 
If her name's Bobby, I'm not saying you're not the one, just saying. <laughs> but it's just like constant. You might, don't look at them, but like you might know somebody where it's just like they're in, in love all the time with somebody new. Um, what about you change who you are in front of them? You feel like you have to be different, look different. Maybe you feel like you got to be a certain size. Maybe you feel like you got to like do the things that they enjoy. You see this a lot in marriages that end up splitting up. What do they normally do? People normally go back to being who they really are. They start pursuing the things that they pursued in the first place because they forsook or they faked it for the sake of their relationship. Can I tell you, wearing a mask seems fun for a while, but you get sick and tired of being fake. And that's why at Brace Smart, every time you see people get divorced, they normally go back to doing the things that they were before, but they, just, they traded inauthenticity to win the relationship. Um, what about your dating relationship is stronger than your relationship with Jesus? In pre-marriage counseling, I always ask this question, and I do it in reverse on purpose because I always want to test the waters. And it's funny, I'll, I'll say, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how's your dating relationship right now? Oh, it's an eight. Oh, I'm telling, I mean, I would say 10, but I know that sounds bragging, but I'm just telling you, like, it's so amazing. And I'll be like, okay, that's, that's cool, that's cool. And you, you'll see them smile, and they're like, you know, they're doing the flirty eyes, and they're like, oh, I was going to say 10. Okay, oh, I said eight. I'm, I want to say 15 out of 10, you know. And then you ask them, well, how's your relationship with Jesus? And they'll be like, well, I mean, it's probably a four. So, and can I tell you, like, I can promise you the percentages are super high that the ones that I have sat down and counseled that the, that the relationship was better than the relationship with Jesus, they've either gotten a divorce or they are experiencing severe marriage problems. Especially if your goal in the beginning was to be involved in church or to be a believer. Because I'm telling you, you know, you've probably seen the old triangle where it's like if two people are pursuing Jesus, they get closer together. But some people have traded. Some, some of you, like, the only, the only reason why you have a relationship with Jesus is because you hope that he'll bring you somebody. And then once he does, once you get what you want, you're out. That's hard to hear, but I think there are a lot of people who would benefit to say, listen, I need to work on me, and I need to work on my relationship with Christ before I can even have the weight of loving somebody else. And we'll talk about that, but until you really learn the love of Christ, how do you really know what love is. Another one is unpacked baggage. This is what I like to call hidden conversations that we normally don't have. Um, we did a series a couple years ago called Beds and Baggage. And it was cool because we actually had couples that were dating and they actually sat down and said, okay, we're going to take this sermon to heart. And it was hard. But they went home and they spent hours unpacking conversations that they hadn't had yet. But can I tell you, some of those have gotten married and their marriage is stronger now because they unpack the baggage. It's the hard conversations of, let's talk about your exes. I know that's really, you're like, mm-mm. <laughs> so you're saying, I'm willing to be joined together intimately and physically with one with a person, but I've got stuff I would hide from them? That's not real intimacy. That's why some of you got into marriage thinking that sex was intimacy, but intimacy is fully knowing somebody. Maybe it's a, a, an addiction to pornography that you're terrified. Women, ask the question. I want to tell you right now, if you're married right now, ask the question. If you're like, well, I didn't ask him that up front, so we're not going to talk about that. No, ask the question. Not to embarrass or shame or guilt, not to force them to confess, but to say, hey, is there something we need to pray through? Is there something we need to get help with? I want to help you. I want you to get healing from this and wholeness from this. I'm telling you, it's an issue that will destroy marriages. Ask the question about finances. Do the credit check. <laughs> right, Dylan? Do the credit. But, like, you need to know, do they have a toxic way, toxic view of money? Do they have a poverty mindset that says, if I get money, I have to spend it. Because if I don't, it's fleeting. It, it, it goes away. That's a poverty mindset. And it has nothing to do with how much money you make. There are people who make over $100,000 a year who have a poverty mindset, and they are in complete debt, and their lives are... They have all the toys, 
You know there's a difference between rich and wealthy, right? Rich are the people who want to look rich. They have all the toys, but they're, they're secretly dying. And so have the, ask the questions, because if you don't, can I tell you, these are some of the key reasons for divorce. And we don't unpack the baggage. No self-control in their life. That's another red flag. They have no self-control. No physical self-control, no emotional self-control, any of that stuff, which leads to the next one, which is no boundaries. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about boundaries, but they have no physical, emotional, financial boundaries. Uh, can I tell you, if you feel like you've got to sleep, sleep with them to keep them, that's a red flag. Um, that's not having any physical boundaries in your life. Uh, if you use manipulation, red flag. I've seen people do that. There are relationships that will say, and listen, this is, this is heavy. It's hard to say, but you've probably heard this. Like, if you leave me, I'll kill myself. Can I tell you, that is a red flag. That person needs help. If you've said things like, I'll just, I'll, I can't live with myself. I'll never eat again. I'll never go. There are some that use manipulation in, in a separation. Well, you won't see the kids if that happens. That's manipulation. You're trying, can I tell you that manipulation, guilt, shame, it never leads to long-term transformation, change, or peace. You'll have to use that every day of your life to get what you want. And it's not fun, it's not healthy, and it ends up in dysfunction. But there are, there are people, there are people who never listen to wise counsel, right? These are people, like, being a pastor long enough, I know that there are people, I have the same, normally it's the same people that come asking the same things, and here's what people do. They will ask 10 different people the same question until they get the answer they want. But they'll come back to you later, too, because they realize, like, they still find themselves in the same cycle over and over. And it's because at some point they never listen to wise counsel in their life. Can I tell you, if the only people you ask advice of are your peers, like, some of y'all, I don't get it. Like, you keep calling Jimmy John over here for relationship advice, and he's been divorced twice. That's my boy. He's my ride or die. Well, get out of the car. <laughs> ride with somebody else. If you keep riding with Jimmy, John, you are going to die. <laughs> but if you only listen to your peers, they haven't been through enough things to tell you, hey, avoid this pothole. Some of the best things you can do is go find people in our church that have been married for longer than 40 years and say, I want to talk to that person because obviously they have survived a lot to deal with that man for 40 years. <laughs> like, have y'all met Alan and Bonita? Bonita is a woman filled with grace, y'all. But we don't, you know why? Because the reality is we know that if we hear something we don't like, that means we actually have to do something about it. But if we can find somebody to tell us, hey, you're not drowning. You're a fish. You got this. And slowly they're just adding weights to your ankles. Never listen to wise counsel. Um, and here's the, here's the issue, and here's how we're going to wrap things up. Here's the real reason why we have a lack of self-awareness and while we don't always recognize red flags in us, we fail to see the danger because we are blinded by desire. There's a quote that some other people think this is Bible too, but it gets quoted a lot. The heart wants what the heart wants. You realize that's not scripture, right? In fact, we'll talk about this in a moment, but the Bible tells us about the human heart and the condition of it when it's not transformed by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we have to deal with like, am I blinded by my own personal desires that I can't even have any self-awareness in my own life? I tell you, growing up, watching my mom step into dysfunctional relationship after dysfunctional relationship, it's amazing because sometimes we look at people and, and we judge them, right? Because of the stuff that they, well, we, but what we need to do is understand like this person is so, so wounded and hurt for a relationship that they can't even see what they're doing to the people they care about. 
what I'm asking you to do is not just recognize your red flags because you want your relationships to work out or you want to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright or you want your marriage to get better, but ask yourself, like, how is this affecting my children? How is this affecting my close relationships? Because can we be honest? Some people are tired of swimming out and saving you. And you're putting everybody at risk when they do. So I believe there are three things that are going to help us recognize our own red flags real quickly. One, we need ears to hear. Jesus talked about this every time he would preach a parable. He'd say, he that has ears, let him hear. And this is the ability to discern and hear the voice of God. Don't miss this, though. Here's the difference. It's saying, am I listening to what I want to hear? Or am I listening to what I'm willing to hear? Because those two are different things. Because being willing to hear something means this may sting but it may lead to transformation and healthiness in my life. Are y'all with me? The second thing, we need eyes to see. This means, can I tell you, this is the God's honest truth. We talk about blind spots in our lives. Can I tell you, sometimes it's not blind spots, it's spots you keep hidden. We see it, we just don't want to look at it, right? right? And we think if I don't look at it, it'll go away. But it's the issue of like everybody else sees it but you like do something about it. So it's saying, God, allow me to look at the thing that I know is terrifying. Allow me to look at my, the, the thing that I know. Like, I don't want to have to go back and look at the dysfunction I grew up in, but it may be going back to that place and recognizing it and dealing with it and praying through it and getting process. Pros- that may be the thing that changes my future. We need eyes to see, and last but not least, we need hearts to receive. And that is having a teachable spirit. It's saying, God, soften my heart that what I hear, what I see, I'm actually willing to do something about it. How do I handle feedback? How do I handle counsel that may not be what I want to hear, but it's what I need to hear, right? Because here's what Jeremiah reminds us. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I love how he responds in verse 10. But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. And here's the thing. It's saying, I can not deal with my red flags without the help of the Holy Spirit. That I ask God, God, shine a light in the darkest places and help me address the mess because you know how you get rid of red flags the water gets calm and some of you it's like every time relationships are involved the water gets rough when your wife or your kids come home the current gets strong when tension arises the current gets stronger Some of us need to calm the waters. You know how you do that? You ask the Holy Spirit to help lead you towards personal transformation to where when people encounter you, they encounter calm waters. And then the red flags get removed.